Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Esselamu aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve berekatuhu. Elhamdülillahi rabbil alemin. Vessalatu vesselamu ala aşrafil enbiya vel musalim. Amma ba'd. Brothers and sisters in Islam, today we are welcoming our brother Sheikh Adnan Rashid to give us a talk about the efforts of Shah Waliullah Delwi and Shah Ismail Delwi in spreading Tawhid and Sunnah in India during the British Raj. Sheikh Adnan Rashid has been to Cambridge Islamic Centre and Masjid al class before and to just give you a little bit introduction about him, he has worked with IERA and presented on Islam Channel amongst his many other attributes. And inshallah we welcome our brother Adnan Rashid to our centre. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you uh, for that, brothers. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. I'm very pleased to be here once again in Masjid al-Khlas, Cambridge. And uh, alhamdulillah, I can see that this masjid is trying its best to educate the, the community and organize events for the community, establish salah, Quran, studies, and other things and I encourage all the brothers and sisters watching and listening to support the masjid in Cambridge because there are not many institutions like in this city uh, in this in this city like this particular one so uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained or described the virtues of donating towards good causes in the Quran in a number of different places and the Prophet specifically talked about facilitating a masjid. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated that anyone who builds a masjid as big as the nest of a sand grouse, you know the, the nest of a sand grouse or a small bird is as big as this. Possibly it can fit into my two hands. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said anyone who builds a masjid as big as this will have a house in Jannah. And the house in Jannah is not your house in dunya. The house in Jannah Allah has for you is something unimaginable. You cannot imagine the magnitude and the size and the luxuries that house has for you. So, a little effort in helping to build a masjid, to expand a masjid will effectively get you the pleasure of Allah and by extension a house in Jannah according to the Prophet So brothers and sisters, this masjid needs expansion, the community is growing, the needs are growing, the children need more support and more attention. For that, the masjid needs your support. So please support the masjid and the expansion will cost some money. So do as much as you can and if you want to talk to the brothers uh, in Cambridge who are responsible for this masjid, please do get in touch with them via their online links, their website, and you can see the links inshallah ta'ala in the video below and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for your support Jazakumullah khairan wassalamu alaykum and sisters Jazakumullah khairan for attending this talk today we will be talking about a very very important figure in the history of Islam very well known to scholars around the world whether those scholars are teaching or studying in the Hijaz region or whether those scholars are from Egypt or whether they are from the Far East or from Al Maghrib, which is Morocco, or even, even in Central Asia. This particular personality is very, very well known among the students of knowledge and scholars and to the people of the subcontinent because he was the Indian subcontinent. He was born there in Delhi. And his name is Shah Waliullah. This is the common name he's known by. Although his name is Qutbuddin bin Abdurrahim. His father was Shah Abdurrahim, who was one of the greatest scholars in India alive at his time. And he was one of those people who took part in compiling a huge compendium of Fatawa based upon the Hanafi fiqh. 
So India has a very interesting history when it comes to Islam. Islam in India or the Indian subcontinent before partition, because now the Indian subcontinent consists of three countries mainly. Uh, if you want to add Sri Lanka, that makes it four countries. Okay, but mainly it is Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. This region, all of it put together, was known as Hind in Arabic and in the English language it is commonly referred to as the Indian subcontinent. So before the partition of 1947, after the British rule ended, this region was one region, one country, previously governed by Muslim kings for almost six centuries. So the rule of Islam started in the early 13th century when some of the Turkic slaves who became kings. We had two slave dynasties in the history of Islam. When I say slave, I don't mean actually the word slave uh, as it is understood in the Western history or Western world. Because when you use the word slave, what comes to your mind? Black people enslaved from Africa, taken across the Atlantic, put into slavery in plantations, branded as animals, sold at will, and family split. They have no rights. They have no um, human existence at all in those conditions. So this is what comes to your mind. But in the Islamic context, it is, an, it is a completely different picture. So these were servants bought in or from Turkic tribes in Central Asia by Muslim kings to serve as army personnel in these forces or these armies. So we had two dynasties. One was in Egypt called the Mamluk dynasty and one was in India also called the Mamluk di dynasty. The Egyptian Mamluk dynasty is very well known, very well studied. But the Indian Mamluk dynasty, which was possibly far more powerful and expansive than the Egyptian dynasty, is unfortunately understudied or underdeveloped even by Muslims. So we're talking about India today. So in the year 1206, uh, when one of the Afghan kings who attacked northern India and his name was Muhammad bin Sam Shahabuddin Ghori. He came from a place called Ghor in Afghanistan and he had his servants with him who were originally Turkic. They spoke the Turkish language. They came from the Turkic steppe region which is in Central Asia today. What we call the Asia, uh, Central Asia which is Mawar, um, in Arabic we call it Mawar al Nahar. The ulama understand it uh, as Mawar al Nahar beyond the river. Beyond the river means literally the river Oxus. Okay, or this region is also known as Transaxonia. Okay, Transaxonia literally in Arabic means Mawar al Nahar or the land beyond the river. River Oxus divides Central Asia from the region we know today as Afghanistan and the rest of the Indian subcontinent. So these people came from that region and they became the kings. After Shahabuddin Ghori died uh, in the early 13th century, one of his servants named as Qutubuddin Aybak, who was Turkic, came to power and he was a servant, a slave of Shahabuddin Ghori. And now begins the slave dynasty of India, also known as the Delhi Sultanate. Or they are also known as as of Delhi. Okay, these people were governing India for almost two and a half centuries. So they started in early 13th century, 1206 to be precise. In 1210, Qutb al-Din uh, playing polo. He fell from his horse and he died in Lahore and he's buried in Lahore in Pakistan. Then a man called Iltutmish succeeded him, uh, who governed for a very long time till 1236. So from 12, 
10 to 12:36, we have this man called uh, Sultan uh, Sultan Shamsuddin Il Tutmish, who was governing uh, northern India, and this Sultanate became known as the Delhi Sultanate, and many more Salatin came afterwards, such as um, Sultan Riyasuddin Balban. These are very Turkish names, you know. Those who know Tur the Turkish language, your Turkish culture, you know, these are very Il Tutmish Balban. You know, Aybak or Aybak, you know, these are very Turkic names. So, Sultan Balban, he governed for nearly 20 years uh, with a lot of power, a lot of strength. And at the same time, Mongol invasions started. Baghdad at this time was destroyed by Halaku Khan and a lot was happening on that side of the world. So, cut the long story short, this is the Tamheed, the introduction of the situation in India of Islam. So, after Sultan Balban came another dynasty called the Khiljis and one of the most powerful kings was Sultan Alauddin Khilji who uh, governed a large chunk of northern India and he even carried out incursions into southern India and he became very rich. So this is why from his period we find a lot of coins, a lot of coins in silver, in copper and in gold because he became very rich. Suddenly. He got his hands on so much gold and silver, so he started to mint currency. He became very, very rich, very powerful. And then came the Tughlaq dynasty, uh, who was uh, one of the most powerful kings from the Tughlaq dynasty, was Muhammad bin Tughlaq. Uh, do you guys know Ibn Battuta? Uh, the Rehla of Ibn Battuta, very, very famous work. You know, when this Moroccan or Maghrabi traveler in the mid 14th century, 1300s, traveled from Al Maghrib and he crossed so many countries. So, from the western side, we have Marco Polo, very famous, yes. And from the Muslim world, we have Ibn Battuta, very, very famous. His Rehna is very famous, and what he described in it um, is very interesting. He went to India at this time when Muhammad bin Tughlaq was governing India, and he described some interesting facts about this king and the way he governed and he was even appointed as a Qadi by Muhammad bin Tughlaq of the Maliki Fiqh in India, amazingly. So we move on, after the Tughlaqs came other dynasties such as uh, the Sayyid dynasty and then the Lodi dynasty and then eventually the Mughals, they invaded India. Now these Mughals are not the Mongols, although the term Mughal is a Persianized version of the word Mongols, okay, a Mongol. But the Mughals and Mongols are two distinct people. Mongols are the early Mongol hordes which attacked the Muslim lands, okay, and they caused a lot of devastation. They were attacking India for a century. A lot of people know about Ain Jalut, the battle between Saifuddin al Qutuz and uh, the Mongol army two years after. Baghdad was destroyed in 1260 and Muslims were victorious against the Mongols. A lot of people know about this battle. But what was happening in India, no one, not many people know. Muslims protected India. Muslims, these Muslim kings, this Turkic dynasty, the Delhi Sultanate, protected India from the Mongols for over a century. For over a century, for 100 years. Muslims with their armies were fighting the Mongols protecting India. If the Muslims opened the doors to the Mongols, the history of India would have been different today, like it is different in the other parts of the world. So Muslims fought the Mongols back, never allowed them to enter India. And they lost their sons, princes. You know, one of the Waliul Ahd, the man who was going to succeed his father after Ghayasuddin Balban, the one who men I mentioned who governed almost 20 years from 1266 to 1286. His son, Prince Muhammad, died fighting the Mongols near Lahore. And there's a famous poet in Persian language known as Khusro, uh, who was there in the battle. He was with the K prince and the prince was surrounded by the Mongols and he thought the Mongols are only coming with 3,000 men. 
So any someone who wrote, wrote a note to him with intelligence that the Mongols, 3,000 Mongols are coming to attack Lahore. So instead of writing 30,000, he by mistake wrote 3,000. Okay, so this mistake cost the life of Waliullahad of India, the prince. And he's also known as Shaheed Prince, the martyr prince. So he thought, okay, it's only 3,000, I'll go with a small army. He went there and he realized it were 30,000 Mongols facing him. So many people lost their lives, including the prince himself. And Riyasuddin Balban never recovered from that pain. He never recovered. He died a very sad man because of this loss. He loved his son very much. Moving on. So the Mughals are different to Mongols. So Mughals, the first emperor who, was, who invaded India in 1526, his name was Zahiruddin Muhammad Baba. He was a direct descendant of Taimur. Taimur Link, also known as Timurlane in English language, or Taimur Lang in Persian, which means literally Taimur the lame. He had a problem in one of his legs. He was injured in one of the battles. He never recovered fully. And he used to, you know, he was a lame uh, person in that sense. So he was a great conqueror. He followed the ways of Genghis Khan instead of following the Prophet Sallallahu And he caused much devastation in the Muslim world. He nearly killed the Ottoman Emperor. Uh, in, he nearly destroyed the Ottoman Empire and captured Sultan Bayezid uh, in a battle. And he also invaded India in 1398, long story. So Babur comes to revive the legacy of his great grandfather, Taimur. He wants to be like him. So Taimur wanted to be like Genghis Khan and Babur wanted to be like Taimur, his great grandfather. And then he caused much devastation, but he governed this northern part of India Daily and his surroundings uh, and his surrounding area for about four years. He dies in 1530. His son Hamayun comes to power, and then the Mughals continue. So Mughal kings, the peak of their power was during four reigns or four kings. So Babur only governed four years. He died. He died young. Then came to power his son Humayun. This was the rise of the Mughal power, but he only governed for 10 years and he was ousted by one of his generals, an Afghan general known as Farid Khan, also known as, also known as Sher Shah, the Lion King, who governed for five years and then another 10 years his sons governed. And then Humayun was able to come back with the Persian support. The Iranians, the Safavids supported Humayun and he was able to take back his power. And months later, he fell from his library and he died. Then comes to power his son Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar. And some scholars called him Akfar because of his apostasy from Islam. His initial days were very good. He used to pray in the masjid, he used to put the slippers of the ulama in front of them, the emperor of India. This is how much respect he had for the ulama. Okay? So he had a very good start, but then some irresponsible ulama, ulama asu, people who were not very straight about the dealings, unfortunately he became very disappointed uh, with these ulama and he blamed Islam for this because he himself was an illiterate, illiterate man. He never studied, he, he didn't know how to read and write, he couldn't read books, so he was a very illiterate man. So he was easily persuaded by people who had the ability to speak eloquently and praise him, you know, uh, flatter him with flattery and he would easily be persuaded by them. So some people he was surrounded by changed his mind and put some strange ide ideas in, mind, in, in his mind and he started to come up with his own religion. This is a very superficial picture by the way. For details, you have to go and study the books of history. I'm giving you a very quick summary so that we can go on to Shah Allah very quickly. This is the background, what's happening in India. So during the time of Akbar, Muhammad Akbar, who effectively apostatized from Islam and initiated his own religion. So what he did was he mixed Hinduism with Islam, with Christianity, with Jainism, all of them, one murakkab, you know, one makhlut religion. He said, this is the true religion. And then he started to kill the ulama as well. So he started to execute them, exile them. 
he had a policy, anti-Muslim policy. And amazingly, in Western media, or in the Indian media now, he is hailed as a very generous, tolerant, progressive thinking king. But he was far from that. If you study his history, actually according to the sources, you come to realize that he committed atrocities against not only Muslims, but all Muslims as well. And because he was not in love with Islam, he is hailed as a hero. But the, on the other side, we have another emperor, which we, who we will, we will talk about in due course. Because he was very, he was a very firm Muslim. He is painted as a villain. And this is not only in the British historical works written during the British period. Even now, today, these Hindu nationalists who govern India right now, uh, the BJP version of Islam, they paint the Muslim period as very dark. But alhamdulillah, some very objective historians, not Muslim historians by the way, some <coughs> historians from the West and even from India, they are challenging to you. They are a bunch of liars, you know. You're painting the history as something else. It is not that, what you're saying. So, Akbar caused a big problem for the ulama and for the Muslims in India. What do the Muslims do now? Because he is now actually, you know, when the state is behind you, when the state power is behind a system, that system naturally becomes very powerful. So his ideas were being promoted and Muslim scholars felt themselves cornered, very, very cornered. So he died in 1605, having governed nearly 50 years. And this was the peak of the Mughal period. He conquered many lands and he subdued many people. He had a harem of 300 wives. Because he wanted more than four wives, he had a discussion once. And you know, he had a place called Ibadat Khana, the place of worship, not Masjid, Ibadat Khana. He made a place in his palace where he would bring scholars from different backgrounds to come and argue in front of him in front of him. And this history is actually narrated by one of the scholars known as Mullah Abdul Qadir Badayuni, who himself witnessed all these things taking place in front of his eyes. He was there. He narrates the story as to what happened, what caused Akbar to go crazy, what caused him to apostatize. So he would have Sunni scholars, Shia scholars, Hindus, uh, Buddhists, Jains, all kinds of this mishmash of people sitting in front of him, debating with each other about the reality of life. And this man himself, who is sitting as a judge, is illiterate. He doesn't know any books, he hasn't studied them. He used to get them read to him, no doubt. We have references that he would get people to read the text to him in his court. So he would listen to the text, but wouldn't be able to read them himself. So, these debates caused a lot of confusion in his mind. Because, you know, if your opponent is more eloquent than you are, then you, you look like you're the one losing the debate, right? Even though you may have the haq on your side, the truth on your side, you look like the, the one who's losing the debate. So there were many eloquent people who were upon the batil and they were confusing Akbar. So Abdul Qadir Badayuni, who was there himself, he explained all this in his tarikh called Muntakhabut Tawarikh, very interesting history he wrote in Persian language. It is available in Urdu translations. I don't know if there's an English translation of it. So Akbar caused this big problem. His son Jahangir came to power. Salimuddin Jahangir, who governed for almost 22 years. He died in 1627. His time was also very, very peak. Mughals were very powerful. They had expanded uh, into India. Um, on a huge magnitude. So Jahangir, he, he had to disown a lot of his father's policies because the ulama rose against this idea of new religion. One of them was Sheikh Ahmed Sir Hindi, who was Sufi by his uh, affiliation. He, was, he belonged to the Naqshbandi school and he stood up against this oppression, this anti-Islam activity. And he wrote many letters to court officials to lobby them, to, to revive the spirit of Islam inside them, like what's wrong with you people? 
and he wrote works against non-Shari'i Sufism in India. You see, Sufism in India had many dimensions, many categories. Some people were completely out. They were mystics. They were not Muslims. They were just mystics. You know, they believed in everything, like Akbar became. Now, the emperor himself is supporting that kind of view. Why wouldn't people follow that? Okay, when the court, the king himself is actually following that view. It's like in England. What happened in England? King Henry VIII in the 16th century, he broke away from the Catholic Church. Britain was a Catholic country. There were no Protestants, there was no Church of England in Britain before the 16th century. The king changes his religion because he wants to divorce his wife and he can't get around doing, you know, the Pope is not supporting him. There was a lot of politics involved at the time as well. Big story, big picture. Again, there's a long story, we, want to, we don't want to go into that. So the, he changes his religion within, within 70, 60, 70 years. The population also converts. And things like this happen. This is why the ulama had to rise in India. So things started to change slowly for good. Jahangir slowly disowned some of the policy of his father. Then his son, Jahangir's son came, Shah Jahan. Uh, he changed some of the policies of his father and he became more Islamic, you know. Shah Jahan started to support ulama, so started to fund madaris, religious institutions, and Islam started to come back. Now Shah Jahan had two sons. Very quickly, this is very important for you to understand why Wali Ullah was facing what he was facing very quickly. Because usually my tamheed, my introduction is longer than the lecture itself. <laughs> but it's very important, this information. So Shah Jahan, who governed from 1627 to 1658 when he was deposed by his son Aurangzeb Alamgir. Shah Jahan had four sons. Two of them were more important than, uh, than others. One of them was, his name was Dara Shiko. Dara Shiko was, to put it in simple terms, to simplify things, he was on the path of Muhammad Akbar, Jalaluddin, Muhammad Akbar, who was trying to make a new religion. And Dara Shiko, he used to mix with a lot of Hindu philosophers. He would sit with them, take a lot of knowledge from them, and then he would take a lot of, a lot of knowledge from the Sufi, some of the Sufi, uh, you know, propag uh, propagators in India. So he would sit with them and he would take a lot of ideas from them. So what he started to do, he wanted to like Akbar, like Akbar before him, he started to mix Hinduism with Islam. And then for that purpose he wrote a book called Majmaul Bahrain. Majmaul Bahrain. The meeting of the two seas, when two seas. In this book, he argues that Hindu philosophy and the Sufi mystic philosophy, which is originally Islamic, that's what he said, is actually coming from the same source. They are both the same thing. I mean, they are saying the same. So Hinduism is like Islam. Islam is like Hinduism. So we are all from the same source. So he tried to mix the two together. The ulama, who had already studied the time of Akbar, they knew what happened and the fitna the Muslims had to face at that time. They suddenly woke up. Said, SubhanAllah, this man and Shah Jahan, the king, was favoring this son more than the others because he was the eldest son and he was the closest to the father. So the father kept him very close to him in the court. The other sons he would send them like as governors into other provinces. One of them was Aurangzeb, Muhyiddin Aurangzeb Alamgir Rahmatullahi alayhi. The most Islamic out of all of them. Because he surrounded himself with the ulama. So each Mughal prince would have his own independent court. It would be like a moving country. So there is the emperor in Delhi or in Agra in India. And he would have sons. So each son would have his own court. His own entourage of thousands of people. Servants, women, men, children, his wives, his daughters. Then his sons, the sons of the prince. And they have their own entourages and they have their own funding from the state coming to them. Because the Mughals were the richest people in the world. The richest state at the time of Aurangzeb who would become king after his father Shah Jahan. 25% of world's GDP. GDP was in India. He was the richest king in the world. Richer than the English, the French and the, even the Ottoman Emperor. 
Aurangzeb Alangir. So these princes, Shah Jahan's four sons, they would have their own. So Aurangzeb had surrounded himself with the ulama. He was very, very religious, very deeply involved in religion, studying. He himself was a poet, you know, very learned in religious sciences. So the ulama supported him. So ulama said, this is our man. He should become the emperor, not Darashiko. Because if he becomes the emperor, the same situation will be repeated. What happened at the time of Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar. So they supported him. So a rumor spread when Shah Jahan became sick in 1250, sorry, 1658, 1658, that Shah Jahan is dead. It was a rumor. He was fine. He was well. He was not dead. So Aurangzeb knew that his brother, older brother, Dara Shikhu, who was already conspiring against him for a long time to get him in trouble with the father. So the father had a very tense relationship with his son Aurangzeb, not with Dara Shikhu, who was already in the court. So Dara Shikhu was not a military general because he, he remained in the court. He was one of those soft boys who grew up in the court with all the luxuries around him. Aurangzeb was a battle-hardened general. He was thrown in the middle of the, in the battlefield at a very young age. So he was fighting in Afghanistan, in Badakhshan, in Dakkan, in the south. He was moving all around India. So he knew his country well. And that's the advantage he took uh, in the civil war. So after the rumor spread, the four sons fought each other. Cut the long story short. Okay. Dara Shaku lost the battle. The other two uh, also lost. Uh, uh, one of them was called uh, uh, Shuja, who basically left India with his family, going towards Burma. So he disappeared in the jungles of Burma. He didn't want to fight Aurangzeb because he knew he was going to. And the other one, uh, his name was Murad Baksh. He was also killed by Aurangzeb in a battle. And Dara Shikhu was caught running away from India, going towards Iran at the border, was brought back to Delhi. A trial was conducted. He was put on trial for apostasy and for uh, uh, promoting you know, wrong ideas in the name of Islam and the ulama gave the fatwa that he must be executed. So by the orders of the ulama and the king, he was executed in Aurangzeb. To this day is accused of, you know, killing his brother unjustly. But when, when you study the period and the other Mughal kings, you come to realize this was the norm. Every Mughal king who came to power, he had to kill off his brothers to suppress rebellion. Because every, they didn't have a system they didn't have a proper system of succession. So now Aurangzeb comes to power. Cut the long story short. India becomes the most powerful entity in the world within the time of Aurangzeb Arangir. He becomes the most powerful Mughal king. Why? Because of the finances, finances he had within and the land he had conquered. He conquered almost 95% of India. He was the only king possibly after Muhammad bin Tughlaq who governed the largest chunk of India, the only Muslim king to have governed the largest chunk of India. So he governed from 15, sorry, 1658 to 1707, 49 years, 50 years, very, very long period. In his time, a lot of good things happened. The ulama came to rise. India became very peaceful. Hindus, Muslims coexisted. Aurangzeb gave a lot of important positions to Hindu generals, who were, those who were loyal to him. So people, when they accuse him of bigotry and uh, intolerance, they are a bunch, this is what the modern scholars are bringing up, that why would he have, because he had more Hindus employed under his government than all the previous Mughal emperors put together. Because they were good at finance. The Hindus were good at keeping, you know, what has changed. It's still the same. Yeah, uh, some of the, the Hindus from, from the, the region of Gujarat, they're very good at business, right? So Aurangzeb employed them. He knew the qualities of people and he employed those qualities in, uh, you know, uh, where necessary. In his time was born a man called Shah Abdul Rahim, the father of Shah Waliullah. And this was the renaissance of Islam. Islam was very powerful in India at the time. Scholars studied, many madaris were supported, many people studying the texts. Uh, you know, there were great scholars alive at this time, such as Sheikh uh, Muhammad, uh, Sheikh Abdul Haq Muhaddis al Dehlawi, Rahmatullahi um, He had written many commentaries on Bukhari, Sayyid Bukhari. He wrote a commentary called Taysir al Qari, Fi Shahil Bukhari, uh, which was in Persian. 
and there were other scholars who had started a lot of good work. So Aurangzeb, he asked the ulama, a group of ulama, to compile a collection of fatawa for the use of the people of the country, Muslims, because India was possibly 99% Hanafi. 19, I, mean, I want to be safe, yeah? Maybe there were 1% here. Apart from uh, the, uh, the western coast of India, where we had a people called Nawait or the Yemenis, you know, who had come for business from Yemen, that western coast was inhabited by the Yemenis, they were Shafi. They were Shafis. But the rest of India was Hanafi. Northern India was Hanafi. It followed the, the path or the tradition of the people, people of Mawara and Nahar or Central Asia because the Mughals who came from there, or the Delhi Sultanate, they uh, brought their school with them. So, this fatawa, or the collection of fatawa, which was sanctioned by Aurangzeb, was called Fatawa Alamgiriya, or also known as Al-Fatawa Tulhindiya. Okay? And it is the largest collection of rulings on Hanafi fiqh in the world my knowledge okay it's the largest collection of fatawa on the Hanafi fiqh in the world it was written in Arabic by a number of ulama of course there is a lot in it we don't agree with we are Ahlul Hadith uh, there is a lot we don't agree with but we admire the struggle and the passion of the ulama at the time and the king to help and serve the nation because the people are Hanafi so if people are Hanafi you're not going to give them a al mughni written by Ibn Qudam al maqdisi they're not going to accept it. <laughs> Are they? If you give them al mughni or al tamheed you know, the shark of Mu'attam al Malik, they're not going to accept it. So they will only accept from Hanafi ulama. And they were very rigid. So there was a very strong presence of Sufism in India. Very, very, very strong. In the DNA of people, flowing through the blood of people. Because the people came from the Hindu background, okay? So they were very spiritual naturally, you know, so they wanted some mystical tradition, some ajeeb, you know, they wanted these practices, these spiritual uh, dimensions of Islam, and if they didn't exist in Islam, they made them up in some cases. That's why some of the ulama wrote works in India condemning non-shari'i or non-Islamic Sufism that sometimes caused blatant shirk, like going to the saints and asking them directly, istaghatha. Is Tagatha directly from the man in the grave? You, the Imam or the Wali in the grave, please bless me with a child. My business is down, etc., etc. And the people started to do that. The ulama wrote, people like Shah Wali who came later, wrote works against that practice. So Shah Abdul Rahim was asked, the father of Shah Wali Allah, to take part in the writing, compiling of this fatawa. He refused. He said, I don't want to take any part in it. But then his mother forced him to accept. And then he started to, you know, assist in the comp compilation of this fatawa. And uh, then he disagreed with the ulama, the other ulama, on certain issues. And then he was asked to leave the committee. And he left. And the government or the emperor tried to give him a grant of land. And he refused it. He said, no, I don't want anything from the government. So he lived in very humble uh, position. And then... Uh, he taught his son Shawali Allah was born in the year 1703. Now we talk about Shawali Allah. Shawali Allah is very important for a number of reasons because he initiated a revival movement of Islam in India at a time when the Indian subcontinent was going through a huge political change. The political climate had started to change by or oh, after the death of Aurangzeb Alamgir. So Shah Allah was born in Delhi in the year 1703. And Aurangzeb died in 1707. So Shah Allah, Qutbuddin bin Abdul Rahim was four at the time when uh, Aurangzeb Alamgir died, the most powerful Mughal emperor. So in his young age, he had seen, obviously, if he remembered, or his father had told him about the glory of Islam in the days of Aurangzeb Alamgir. He knew about it. And his father was very, very loving to him. In fact, Shah Allah was born of the second marriage of his father. His father was 60 years old when he took his second wife uh, and he expressed his desire 
And when people criticized him for that, that you're 60 years old and you're taking another wife, and he said, well, I have been he had a vision from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I am to have a son who will have, who will achieve great things in the future. So one of his disciples gave his daughter to him. So from this bond was born Waliullah and another brother of his called Ahlullah. Okay, known as Ahlullah. So two children were born. Waliullah was taught after the age of five by his father in Hifz, in other religious sciences, in Mantik, uh, in Hanafi Fiqh, and also taught Sufism by his father in the school of Naqshband or Naqshbandi school, he was initiated in that school by his father. So, he gave a lot of love to his son. Shah Abdul Rahim, he gave so much love to his son that his son became deeply involved in Islam because he taught him through love. He didn't beat him up. He didn't, you know, teach him Islam as if it's a punishment. You know, like we teach our children today in Masajid, when they come to the Masjid to learn the Quran, read, read, or you're going to get beaten, like that. Huh? Like this. Some of the some of the teachers they teach children like this. Why would they love Islam? If you teach them Islam in this way, if you are beating them up for not knowing the, their sabak or their dars, huh? Why would they love Islam? Shah Wilullah makes a point of this that I loved Islam because my father made me fall in love with Islam. The way he taught me, the way he gave his love and compassion and attention and respect. Most importantly, he respected his son. And by the age of 10, from five he started, by the age of 10, Waliullah is reading complicated works in Persian language. He has been taught the Arabic language. And when he reaches the age of 14, still a very young boy, his father insists that we should rush your marriage and this why do you want this child waliullah was only 14 he's studying and he's such a good student you want to get him married so quickly he said i have my reasons and you know we believe that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes he opens doors of the unseen allah informs his people whether in dreams or with other through inspiration allah informs people about certain events and we have many examples like this from the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba okay what we call Basira or Firasatul Mu'min you know so he said I have my reasons so they got him married at the age of 14 first marriage of Waliullah and then they realized why this happened because soon after the marriage many people started to die in the family many deaths happened and if this marriage did not take place at this time his marriage would have been delayed for a very, very long time because so many people died in the family. And his father himself died, Shah Abdul Rahim, when Waliullah was 17 years old, in the year 1719. 1719, uh, Waliullah was 17 when his father passed away. And before his father passed away, his father gave him the ijazah. Now, Shah Abdul Rahim had established a madrasa in Delhi called uh, Al-Madrasatul Rahimiya okay uh, and this was a school of religious learning, learning where Shah Walila himself learnt and he would sit in the lectures of his father listening to the tafsir of the Quran okay and there was a very close circle of special students of Shah Abdul Rahim who were advanced students only the most advanced students were allowed to sit in that circle Waliullah was allowed to sit in that circle because of his sharpness and we will see why Allah blessed him with this in due course very quickly inshallah. So Shah Waliullah he took over from his father the responsibility of teaching hadith and tafsir in Madrasa Tarrahimiya and his father gave him the ijazah to do so. So from the year 1719 to 1731 how many years is that? 12 years? Yeah, 12. 12 years. Shah Waliullah studied 12 years. Studied, taught, studied, taught, studied, taught. And he mastered Sahasita, obviously, he knows the Arabic language, his father had already taught him. 
in, has mastered the books of fiqh. The Hanafi school has already been mastered by him. And the Quran, and he started to write a translation of the Quran, which was titled Fathur uh, Rahman. Fathur Rahman, and he, he faced a huge opposition. Some of the people in India said, don't translate the Quran. He said, no, if you don't translate the Quran, these people are so jahil, they're involved in shirk and they're involved in bid'ah, they're involved in all kinds of things. How will they ever learn about Islam? If they don't read the Quran in their own language, because they don't know the Arabic language, which is clear, the Persian language is the language of the Muslims in India at that time predominantly. Let them read the Quran in their own language so they can actually appreciate the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they fa he faced opposition. He still continued with his translation, which is uh, a huge achievement. Then in 1731, having taught, having studied uh, in depth, he started to feel the urge naturally or from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go to Hijaz for Hajj. Hijaz. He wants to go to the Arabian Peninsula. Now, very quickly, what's the situation in India now? What's happening when Shah Walilullah is going through all of this? The background, the political background. The Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb is dead by 1707 when Shah Walilullah is four, yes? After his death, there is chaos. Chaos. His son Bahadur Shah defeats all his brothers and he comes to power. Bahadur Shah is inclined to Shiaism. He's inclined to Shiaism. <coughs> Strangely enough, being the son of Aurangzeb Alamgir, the champion of Ahl Sunnah, he is inclined to Shiaism. And he was so inclined to Shiaism that he issued an order in India that every member must read, or every Imam on the member on Jummah must read Ali Wasiullah, part of the khutbah. Ali Wasiullah. So when this issue came to Lahore, you know, do you know anyone, uh, anyone's been to Lahore? Those of you who have been to Lahore, you know this big, when you enter Lahore from the old road, not the motorway, the old road, what we call the GT road or the Grand, Grand Trunk Road, yeah, when you enter Lahore from the old road, the first thing you will see in Lahore is the Badshahi Mosque. Okay, literally uh, uh, Al Masjidul uh, Malakiya, is that what you're going to call it in Arabic? Yeah, the King's Mosque, the Badshahi Mosque. Aurangzeb Alamgir completed this masjid in 1674 when he had been on the throne for a few years and this masjid is wallahi is a gem of architecture in the history of Islam. You just have to go and google Padshahi Mosque Lahore. You know it was one of the biggest masajid in the world for a very long time. Possibly one of the big, possibly the biggest masjid in the world because the courtyard can easily take a hundred thousand people in it. Okay it's a huge masjid. So the, when the issue of calling or saying the words Ali Rasulullah in, uh, in the Bachai Mosque, the people of Lahore rebelled against the king. They said, Khalas, we're not gonna, we're not gonna convert, we're not gonna change our religion. You're trying to change our religion. We're not going to the Imams, the ulama of the mosque, they went against Bahadur Shah, who was the son of Aurangzeb Alangir. And Bahadur Shah he commanded, turn the guns towards the people. Yani, you know, what we call the cannon. Guns, turn them towards the people and start firing. But his son, his son came to him and he said, don't do this. This is going to cause a countrywide rebellion and you will lose your power. Don't fight the people. Leave the people, leave the religion, don't change the religion. And then he said, okay, no words in this khutbah or in this masjid. <laughs> so he abandoned the idea in Lahore, alhamdulillah. But then he died soon after. After his death, uh, there was chaos, internal fighting among the princes to take the throne. Eventually, a uh, man called Farukh Siyar came to power. From 1712 to 1719, he governed. And he was very close to the father of Shah Waliullah, Shah Abdul Rahim, who would advise him on government affairs and try to, try to bring him close to Islam as much as possible. The Mughals, their moral condition had declined now. They were heavily involved in drinking, singing, dancing, they are having parties. They have completely lost the track. They completely have completely lost the plot, as they say, right? So now there is chaos in the country because of this central weakness in the government. What happens? Finances start to suffer. 
finances start to suffer. When finances start to suffer, the army stops. When the army is not paid, what happens? The defense of the country is weakened. When the defense was weakened, external powers started to rise. The Sikhs in Punjab, they started to destroy the countryside, started pillaging villages and destroying crops and buildings and in many cases a lot of oppression took place. Then came to rise another people called the Jats, another nation of Hindus who rose and they started to cause a lot of devastation in the lands Muslims governed successfully. Then another menace which came to rise from the south, from Maharashtra in southern India, not completely south but it's uh, nearly southwest. Uh, these people were known as Marathas or Marhatas or Marathas. They also rose and they started to foster ideas to invade Delhi altogether and take it. You know, completely wipe out the Muslim government. For six centuries, five centuries, uh, from, from 1200 to 1700, from 1200 to 1700, no one could imagine in the wildest of dreams to think of Delhi because the Muslims are so strong and powerful. Now has come the time that everyone is looking at the, the cake and they want a slice of the cake. And Shah Allah has now realized so what's going on. The moral condition of the people has declined because the political condition of the kings and the court has declined and the Muslim power is declining. So now he's seeing all of this and he wants to travel to Hijaz now for Hajj. In 1731 he leaves Delhi with his companions and he goes for Hajj. He comes to a place called Surat which is a port where you take the ship to Jaddah. And the journey was very difficult for him. There are many details in his biography uh, which he has written himself called Anfasul Arifin. Uh, in this he puts down a lot of things about his experiences uh, in life. So it's called Anfasul uh, Arifin where he talks about his father and his love for his father. He talks about certain, uh, himself as well. It's like an autobiography. So the journey was very difficult, so he eventually ends up in Hijaz. He stays in Hijaz for 14 months. Look, just, just listen to this very carefully. In 14 months, he studies with ulama. He covers the entire text of Muatta Imam Malik with a sheikh in Makkah called Sheikh Wafdullah, who was an authority on the Maliki fiqh, and he takes Hijaza in uh, Muatta from the sheikh to teach hadith. Then, in Medina, there is a giant of a sheikh of hadith from the Shafi school. His name was Sheikh Abu Tahir al-Kurdi. The shortest chain of hadith in the world today, right now as we speak, in the world, in the Muslim scholars or among the Muslim scholars, is through Shah Waliullah and Abu Tahir al-Kurdi. This is a challenge. If anyone can produce a shorter chain, what we call Sanad Ali, Going back to the Prophet ﷺ of Hadith, in Hadith, I'll stand corrected. If anyone can produce a shorter chain. Amazingly, from India, out of all places in India. And this is why a lot, a lot of the ulama, the Arab ulama, they accept, they admit that the service of Hadith which has been done in India, we cannot find other examples of it in the Muslim world. After the early Muhaddithin, the later Muhaddithin, for example, people like Sheikh Abdurrahman Mubarak Furi, who wrote a giant commentary on Sunan al Tirmazi, is absolutely amazing. It was so amazing that when Sheikh Muhammad bin Ibrahim, Ali Sheikh, the teacher of Sheikh bin Baz, heard about it or read it, he sent a letter to him to give ijazah to Sheikh Muhammad bin Ibrahim. He sent a letter to Sheikh Abdurrahman Mubarak Furi, who is in India, asking him to give ijazah to this Sheikh who descended from Sheikh Muhammad al Wahab to give him ijazah in Hadith. The Mufti of Halb or Damascus, if I'm remembering, remembering it correctly, wrote a letter to Sheikh Abdurrahman Mubarak Furi to give him ijazah in Hadith after this commentary. 
So there's another commentary on Abu Dawood written also by another Indian scholar named uh, Sheikh Shams al Haq Azim Abadi, and his commentary is known as Aun al Ma'bud. He also came from the same group of ulama who were teaching in India the science of hadith. This is another topic in itself completely, which will take us take us on a different tangent. But Shah Waliullah is always there. Shah Waliullah is always there in the middle, standing as a giant who facilitated all of this. He was not like the later Ahlul Hadith, no doubt. You know, the Ahlul Sunnah split into different groups in India after Shah Waliullah Dehlavi. Shah Waliullah died in the 18th century. In the 19th century, Ahlul Sunnah split into few major groups. Some close to Sunnah, others far from it. One of the schools that came to rise was Ahlul Hadith. The school of Ahlul Hadith who did not follow any school of thought blindly. They did not follow Hanafi school or Shafi school or Hanbali or Maliki school. They directly followed the evidence, Sahih Sitta, for example, uh, authentic hadith. And this tradition was actually initiated by Shah Waliullah himself. He is the one who brought this open-mindedness to India. Previously, you could not talk about, you know, even Raf al in a masjid in India, you could get killed. And there was an incident which happened in the time of Shah Waliullah. I will narrate it later on, remind me if I forget. So very quickly, Shah Waliullah goes to Hijaz and he starts to study with, uh, he start to st starts to study with these giant ulama. So Sahah Sitta is covered with Shaykh Abu Tahir al-Kurdi. Within 14 months, Allah put so much barakah in his time that within 14 months he was able to do all these things. And he was a very deep, he was Zahid, Abid, you know, Mudabbir, you know, who used to contemplate a lot on the Quran. His connection with the Quran was very, very powerful, very strong. In Makkah, he wouldn't move from the Kaaba. He sat next to the Kaaba, listening to the ulama, taking knowledge from them. And during that period, Allah blessed him with a lot of visions and dreams. He had so many dreams, you know, getting messages from the unseen. And some of these dreams he has documented in a book of visions. He has documented in a book called Fuyud al Haramain. Fuyud al Haramain literally means uh, the blessings of the two mosques. The blessings of the two mosques. So he received many visions, and some of the visions actually, one of the books he wrote later on, titled Hujjatullah al Baligha, which is a giant work about this book, Nawab Siddiq Hassan Khan Rahmatullahi al Qunnuji uh, stated that in the entire history of Islam, a book like this has not been written. SubhanAllah, that's a very big statement. That's a very big, because it's a, it's a very unique book. It took a very unique angle. It's in Arabic. It is available in Urdu, Arabic, and in English. Some translation is also available in English. Marcia K. Hersenman uh, is a woman. She has translated Shawari Allah's Hajjatullah al-Baligha into English language. Uh, you can find it online. It's a very expensive print, unfortunately. Uh, it's over 100 pounds, the translation, published by E.J. Bro. But you can find a cheaper version of it from Pakistan, which I <laughs> did, alhamdulillah. So you can find the same book for four pounds in Pakistan. Same print, you know. Uh, it's just a matter of being able to buy books from different uh, publishers for cheaper price. And so, the, 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 and this is this is the testimony of Sadiq Hassan Khan about Hajjat al Baligha. Yes. Saying there is no book that has what it He said he said that in the history of Islam, a book like this has not been written, because Hajjat al Baligha is a very unique angle. Shah Waliullah took a very different angle to the book. What he did was he explained the asrar of Sharia. He justified Sharia because. At his time, a lot of questions, because there was so much political trauma, like we have today. There was there's so much, look, Syria, Palestine, Libya, you know, all of this turmoil in the Middle East, Egypt, yet people start to question Islam. Why is this happening to us? Why is Allah doing this to us? Why is this musibah? Why is this killing? Why is this suffering? SubhanAllah. In the times of turmoil, people start to you know, those who have weak Iman, those who have little connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they start to ask these stupid questions. Someone has to answer them, right? 
Shaulillah, he wrote this book to answer these questions for his time. People were asking questions. So the book is very philosophical in its approach, yet within the boundaries of Sharia. Amazing job. You have to read it in order to understand what I'm talking about or what, uh, what Nawab Siddiq Hassan Khan meant by his statement. So Waliullah, he stated that Allah had inspired him during this journey of Hijaz to write this book. The thought came to his mind that he must compile a work like this. So he spent 14 months collectively in Medina and Makkah, taking a lot of knowledge from the ulama, different ulama, more so from Sheikh Abdullah and Sheikh Abu Tahir al-Kurdi, took ijazas from them and others. Sunan al-Dharami he studied and other texts of hadith partly studied and 14 months later he returned. Sheikh Abu Tahir al-Kurdi died a year after Shah Walilullah returned. As if Allah kept him alive to give this authority to this man so that he can go in India and spark a revolution. Wallahi, ajeeb. Yeah? And Sheikh Abu Tahir al-Kurdi, at times when he would be teaching hadith to his student, Waliullah, how old is Waliullah now? 30, 17, 31, he is 27 or 28 years old. Young man, 27, 28. But when he is teaching Abu Tahir al-Kurdi, he was an old man in his 70s or 80s, teaching hadith to a 20 years, 28 years old young man. He said about Waliullah that I give him the authority in words, he gives me the authority in meaning. Allahu Akbar. He goes, when I narrate the hadith, Waliullah, he explains the meaning to me. This is a shaykh who has taught hadith all his life. This is how sharp this young man was. His connection with Allah and his messenger and his love and his contemplation, the level of his contemplation and tadabbur was so deep that Shaykh, his teacher, Shaykh Abu Tahir al-Kurdi, said this about Shah Walilullah. So, having conducted his studies, intense studies, he comes back to, uh, he comes back to India. When he comes back to India, Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar, he starts to teach completely differently. His methodology, his modus operandi, has changed. His cousin who was with him, Sheikh Ashik Pulati, uh, one of his cousins, his uncle's son, who accompanied him as a companion, and this man, Sheikh Ashik uh, Pulati, is the man responsible for collecting Shah Walilullah's works, and he is the one who made them available for posterity. Like Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah. You know who collected the works of Ibn Taymiyyah? Rahmatullah, Sheikh al Islam. It was his student Ibn al Qayyim, mainly. He, it was his effort collecting the works of his Shaykh and making them available for the posterity. Just like that, Shaykh Ashik Pulati was the one who took a lot of this knowledge, collected it. Even his letters, even his letters he wrote to other people were collected by him. So he came back and Shaykh Ashik of Pulati, uh, he said that Shah Walilullah changed completely when he returned to India after this experience. After Hijaz, his content changed. His delivery changed and after returning he started to write these books so one of the big biggest contributions uh, to the history of Islam or to the literature of Islam he made was this book called Hujjatullah al amazing book on uh, Muslim philosophy or Muslim metaphysics if you want to call it that he explained Islam rationally for the masses and this book is so powerful that anyone who reads it the ulama kibar ulama even from and the Hijaz region, they were shaken. They were subhanAllah, this is a very powerful book, a very unique angle he took. And he was very close to Ibn Taymiyyah. Some scholars even believe that in Waliullah there was a murakkab, there was a mixture of Al Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah. So he had the mysticism of Al Ghazali, you know, uh, the philosophy, the philosophical mind of Ghazali and the Shari'i mind or the textual mind of Ibn Taymiyyah. So he brought the text of because he was exposed to the works of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah in Hijaz. So when he was taught in Hijaz, he came to know this giant of theology, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, and then also uh, Imam Ghazali and other Aima he studied from. And then his works reflect that very much, very powerfully. Other works he wrote were on, for example, Usul al-Tafsir, he wrote a book titled Al-Fawz al-Azim, uh, Al-Fawz al-Kabir or Fawz al-Azim, uh, uh, on Asul al-Tafsir. Then he also wrote a Risala uh, Al-Insaf uh, Fi Salabi Ihtaraf uh, uh, 
I don't remember the name, but this Risala is on the causes of differences of opinion among different schools. So when he came back, he came back a very open-minded man. He was not a rigid Hanafi like he was in the past. If you see his early works and his later works, there is a huge transition from Waliullah of pre-Hijaz and Waliullah of post-Hijaz. So after Hijaz, Waliullah has changed. His mind has opened. Allah has opened his mind to realities he couldn't understand previously. So he starts to write openly. You know, he starts, starts to support uh, other opinions. For example, one of the first things and the most important things he does to open the minds of the Hanafis in India who are very rigid in the view. And some to this day, unfortunately, are very rigid and they don't want to listen to the Dalil or the strength of the Dalil. Dalil he wrote. Shawalullah wrote a commentary on, uh, on uh, Mu'atta of Imam Malik. Remember he took authority in Mu'atta from Sheikh Abdullah in Hijaz, comes back and he writes a commentary called uh, Musaffa uh, in Arabic and Musaffa, sorry Musaffa uh, or Musaffa, one in Arabic and one in Persian. One of them is known as Musaffa, the other one is known as Musaffa, okay? And both of these commentaries were made available to his students and their minds were opened. So he started to, for example, support non-Hanafi opinions because he found the Hadith to be very, very strong in favor of that. So what happened once in, in, in his masjid, a man came, a scholar from another part of India, and he came and he did his salah with Rafa Yudan. This was asking for trouble at that time. So people grabbed him. Like, who, 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 what kind of prayer is this? What are you doing? Huh? You crazy? What are you doing? So they grabbed him and they were going to beat him up. So Waliullah was not present in the much of the time and he came back and he rescued him. He said, oh, leave him, leave him, leave him. What's wrong with you people? And they asked him, that he's praying in a strange way. He said, no, this is sunnah. Leave him. This is also sunnah. Leave him. Let him pray like this. And this man, when he was alone with Waliullah, he said, you know all this and you don't teach people this? Or you don't do, you don't do it yourself in the masjid? He said, if I did it myself, who would save you today? He said, if I was myself doing this, I would have been killed. I would have been killed by the people of India. You know, the people were very rigid in the school. They, wouldn't, they didn't want to hear anything. So, Waliullah, in, in this book, Hujjatullah al-Baliga, I mentioned, he said, people who do Rafa Yadan, with this, with, you know Rafa Yadan, what it is? Before you go into Raku and after you stand from Ruku, you raise your hands up to your shoulders. This is Rafa Yudan, yes? He said, people who do it are better than those who do not do it. Why? Because the evidence is overwhelming. But then he also said that if it causes fitna, if it causes problems, if it, you know, if it, if, if it causes a commotion, then it is possibly better to avoid it. That's the opinion he followed. But later on, his grandson, Shah Ismail Shaheed, he went to the next level and he said, Khalas, we have to do it. It's from the Sunnah, we have to do it. We have to practice it. But his life is another topic in itself. We will not have time to cover uh, the life of Shah Ismail Shaheed and his son Shah Abdul Aziz. Giants, giants, all of them. Waliullah, his son Abdul Aziz, and then uh, his nephew Ismail Shaheed, who died in 1831, fighting against the Sikhs in, uh, uh, in the region of Pakistan today because he believed that the Sikhs were oppressing the Muslims at the time. Ranjit Singh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh was the king of Punjab. He governed from Peshawar to Multan, one of the biggest empire Sikhs have ever governed uh, systematically. And these people from Delhi, from the school of Delhi rose and they came around from Afghanistan behind the Sikhs from Peshawar. They started to conquer land from the Sikhs. And then they were betrayed by some of the Pashtun tribes, unfortunately and they lost the battle of Balakot in 1831. Shah Ismail Shaheed, the grandson of Shah Walullah, and his Imam, his uh, Amir, Sayyid Ahmed Shaheed, also were killed, the, the, the battle was lost, but the movement continued. And then in 1857, in the mutiny, people came up, and then eventually it ended up as the independence of Pakistan, 1947. But the point is, going back to Shah Walullah, this man had served his people immensely. To make the final points about his life and his importance, he wrote books on all necessary topics of his time. For example, another issue which uh, arose at that time was there was a very strong Persian influence 
in India. Very, very strong Persian Shia influence in India. Okay, Shah Virullah wanted to tackle that. He wanted to do something about it. So what he does is, he starts to write a book. Because the main issue of confusion in India at the time, the debate was about the legitimacy of three Khulafa. Khulafa al-Thalatha. Who? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman. The Shia scholars or proponents at the time were, were arguing that their legitimacy is in question or they were not legitimate Khulafa. Legitimate Khalifa was only Ali bin Abi Talib because he was appointed by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that's why he was legitimate. So many confusion, uh, confusion arose from this problem. So Waliullah um, and also some of the Shia uh, states, one of them was Awad, was threatening Muslim existence because they had sided with the Marathas. Marathas when they were attacking Muslims, Marathas, you know, I talked about them earlier, that when they were attacking Muslims, uh, the state of Awadh, governed by Asim al um, uh, initially, and later on, uh, one of his sons, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Safdar Jang, who had allied with the Marathas uh, and, and the Jats, and the Jats to attack the Delhi kingdom, the kingdom of Mughals. Because if the kingdom of Mughal falls, the Sunni power effectively falls. So Shah Waliullah had realized that politically now the Shia entity politically is threatening the existence of Islam and Muslims or the Sunni Muslims in India. So he took on this task to write this work titled Izalatul Khifa An Khilafatil Khulafa. So this is again an encyclopedia of information originally written in Persian. Now fortunately for us recently, very recently, translated into Arabic by one of our uh, teachers, may Allah bless him, Sheikh Muhammad Bashir Salkoti. He has translated the entire text from Persian into Arabic of this book. And I recommend those of you who know Arabic language, you must read this book. Izalatul Khifa. An Khilafatil Khulafa is two volumes in Arabic uh, translated directly from Persian and this book can be found, it is available in Pakistan uh, you can get it from there inshallah so he wrote this book and it had a huge impact on the minds of the people who had confusion on this issue it clarified the issue uh, subhanallah people didn't know how to thank Shah Waliullah for this then his son also wrote a book on the similar issue Tuhfa Ithna Ashariya, which was dealing with the issue of uh, uh, Shia, Shubhat in India at the time. And Shah Abdul Aziz, the son of Shah Waliullah, when he wrote his book Tuhfa Ithna Ashariya, he writes in the Muqaddama that there is not a house which is not influenced by Shia thought in India. For that reason, I want to write this book to clarify the picture of the Sunni opinion on matters. And Alhamdulillah, that book took the Shia circles by storm and almost over 25 responses were written. There is a, there's a Shia scholar from India. He has passed away not very long ago. His name is Athar Abbas Ridwi. He has written a book on Shah Waliullah and Shah Abdul Aziz. And when he wrote a book, wrote his book on Shah Abdul Aziz, half the book is dealing with Tawfa Ibn Sharia, discussing it and refutations about it. So Shah Waliullah had a huge impact on educated minds, the intellectual side of the Muslims and also on the masses. There was a huge movement in Madrasa Ar-Rahimiyya. Thousands of students came, took Hadith knowledge from him and went back to their towns in India. They spread all over India. So Islam as we know it today in India, as we know it today in India, Islam in Hind goes back to one house, one family, one Madrasa, one neighborhood. It is Madrasa Rahimiyya. The man is Shah Waliullah Dehlavi. He is the one who revived or possibly he resuscitated Islam in India because Islam was facing a lot of problems in him at the time. And politically, he served the Muslims in a number of different ways. He wrote letters to Muslim kings and powerful nobles to do something about the situation of the Sikhs, of the Jats and the Marathas. So, because the Marathas are pillaging Muslim villages and Muslim cities, and now Delhi had been plundered. 
Delhi itself had been attacked by the Marathas and they plundered the city to such an extent that the, the people of Delhi, very civilized, very, very, you know, very civilized, very soft, very nice people, literary people, educated people, they started to think of suicide. How suicide? They started to gather the women and they wanted to kill them before the Marathas get their hands on them, subhanAllah. Shah Walullah told these people not to do that, this is not from Islam and think of the situation of Hussein bin Ali bin Abi Talib. Look what happened to him at Kufa in Karbala, what happened to him? He didn't kill his women, he knew these people are going to get their hands on them, he didn't kill his women or children, so don't do that. To protect them or protect their honor, don't do that, don't do this. So he protected lives like that. This is how much threats Muslims are facing. So what does Shah Walullah do? Does he sit around and with his head? Uh, in his hands and uh, oh Allah what, what do we do now make dua make dua in the masjid you do that like most Muslims do mashallah tabarakallah make dua this is what's happening there make dua brothers and sisters need our help make dua no he didn't do that he started to do what he could do in his capacity he started to write letters he started to write letters to people like Najib al-Dawla a very powerful Rohila Nawab in northern India uh, who governed the state of Rohil Khand. Then the Nizam of Dakkar, he started to write letters to him. And then the king of Afghanistan, that was the decisive blow. Ahmad Shah, the king of Afghanistan, who had already invaded India a number of times. So he said to him that you're the only man alive today in the world who can save the Muslims of India from destruction. The Muslims of India from destruction. If you don't come to rescue, Allah will question you. And then he explains the political situation of India in this huge letter. It's a long letter which can be found in a collection of letters collected by uh, Khaliq Ahmad Nizami. And the book is in Urdu primarily. Uh, it's called Shah Waliullah Ke Siyasi Maktubat. And the letters of Shah Waliullah can be found translated into Urdu from Persian in this book. And the letter he wrote to Ahmad Shah Abdali uh, or Durrani, Ahmad Shah Durrani, also known as Ahmad Shah Durrani, is a huge letter. Whether Ahmad Shah invaded India as a result of that letter or not is, uh, is, is another question altogether, and historians have debated. But in 1761, Najib ud Nizam from Dakkar, and Ahmad Shah. Three armies get together, Muslims, Sunnis, and they fight the Marathas in a place called Panipat, 1761. And they break the back of the Maratha threat. For the next 20 years, Marathas were not able to stand up on the knees. A hundred thousand Marathas were killed in this battle, and another hundred thousand ran with their lives, 1761. And a year later, 1762, Shah Walullah passed away, he died in Delhi, and he's buried in Delhi, and he did his services to Islam politically, literally, uh, you know, Islamically, name it, he was there to serve the Ummah, he did what he could in his power, and he stands as a mujaddid of the 18th century, clearly, in the eyes of the, the major ulama of this Ummah, and this Ummah can never pay him back for his favors, and we should, as an Ummah, pray for his Forgiveness, may Allah mis forgive his mistakes, because he made mistakes, no doubt, he made mistakes. But he spoke against Bida and Shirk, which was rife in India at the time, against grave worshipping, Shah Walullah spoke against it, although it was not easy to do so in India at the time. He tackled uh, the Shia Shubhat, which was not easy at the time. He wrote letters to kings of uh, you know different states to come and rescue the Muslims, it was not easy uh, at the time. So. Allah protected him all the way. And after him came his son, Shah Abdul Aziz, who took over from him, 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 him and, and he also has a very, very unique history, which we can discuss at another stage in the future. Jazakumullah khairan for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.